welcome to Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, break down the process, and meet others who've done it so you can leap into your own story. We interview amazing guests who provide powerful insights that inspire you to get your story told. Be sure to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com, and while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media network. Now sit back, get ready to take some notes, and let's get started. This episode of Leap Into Your Story podcast is brought to you by Leap Into Your Story course. Visit leapintoyourstory.com where you have a guide to get your story told. I'm Victoria Anderson, and welcome to the Leap Into Your Story podcast you discover your inner story, work through the process, and meet others who've done it. We interview amazing guests who provide powerful insights that will inspire you to leap into your own story. So be sure to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com. While you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media network. In this podcast episode, we're going to be discussing afterlife files, near-death experience, and shared death experiences. My guest today is Dr. Scott Taylor, a spiritual teacher, speaker, author, and researcher on near-death experience, as well as the president of the Expanded Awareness Institute. So welcome, Scott. Thank you for joining us today. Well, hi, Victoria. I have been looking forward to this, so I I can't wait for our conversation to begin. Yes, you have some very interesting um, topics that I'm sure listeners are just anxious, or I should say dying to (laughs) experience, right? Put it on a little pun, right? (laughs) That's a groaner. (laughs) (laughs) But before we dive into some questions. Take us on the journey and how did this all start for you? Sure, I'd I'd be delighted to. Um, Back in 1981, I was in love with a woman. Her name was Mary Frances. And she and her son Nolan um, had been out sailing on beautiful Lake Washington in southern Minnesota. And on their way home, Uh, They were involved in this horrific car accident, and Mary Fran was was killed instantly, and Nolan had a a severe head wound, and it took him six days to make his transition. Luckily, we live in southern Minnesota, and we weren't that far from the Mayo Clinic, so both Mary Fran and Nolan were taken to, um, to Mayo, and they received just, you know, just terrific care. So hats off to the healthcare people at Mayo. Thank you very much. Um, but the six days winds up being important because Mary Fran was one of nine children and Nolan was the eldest grandchild. And so, you know, the family really wanted to rally around Nolan, support him. And the six days allowed for, you know, all of the brothers and sisters and friends and aunts and uncles and grandparents and, you know, everybody to come and converge onto, um, onto, you know, St. Mary's Hospital in Rochester. Well, what happened was because there were so many people that were coming to support Nolan and hold vigil with him, um, we did a simple thing. We said, okay, it's a small hospital room, two of you every two hours, and you just go in and and be with him. And one of the things that the nurses at Mayo told us was that even though Nolan was in a coma, he never came out of it, but even though Nolan was in a coma, they know that hearing is the last sense to go. So it was really important that we talk to him. And so when it was my shift, um, I, I went in with Mary Fran's eldest sister, Janie, and we had the 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. shift on the morning of the sixth day. 
And so we brought his favorite storybook and, and read him stories. We told him about the crazy things his uncles were doing um, in the hospital. Um, what had happened that night was that the uncles had gotten tired of sleeping on a hard floor in the waiting room. So they had gone throughout the whole Mayo system and swiped the cushions off of the couches and put them on the floor of the waiting room so it could be more comfortable. And we just, you know, told him, you know, what was going on with, uh, with his care and you know, just, you know, generally things that you would do with a seven-year-old and you know, just keep up that chit-chat. Well, it gets to be about quarter to five in the morning and Janny goes to the end of the bed and picks up his chart and is reading it. She was a nurse that was trained in trauma care, so she knew what she was looking for. And so she's looking at his chart, and then she's looking at all the monitors that are up there. And, you know, this expression gets on her face, it's, and she holds her hand out to me and says, Scott, it's, it's time for us to say goodbye. So we pulled up a couple of chairs next to Nolan's head, and we told him that he was loved dearly and that he had been struggling so hard to stay with us and that he had been such a brave boy. And we really honored and respected him for doing that. But if his mother should come, now remembering that Mary Fran died six days before, um, that if his mother should come and ask him to go with her, that that would be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And we again told him how much we love and cared for him. And by this time it's five o'clock, the next shift is coming in. And so we leave and, you know, go into the waiting room and try to find a spot on the floor. So we're, where we can be comfortable. Anyway, so about 45 minutes later, the nurse on the floor comes in to all of us that are scattered throughout this waiting room and says, um, he's declining. Uh, it won't be long now. It, you should go into the, into the room. So this whole lot of us gets up and we file into the Nolan's hospital room. And as luck would have it, I'm one of the last people in line and by the time I get into the room, it's, you know, four or five deep around the bed because there are, I mean, it's like 40 of us, you know, it, it, it's a lot. And so I just went, well, nuts, you know, I'm, that doesn't make sense for me. So I just went and sat on the windowsill next to Mary Fran's youngest brother, Willie. So he's right there and I'm here and you just kind of wait, you know, there really isn't much to do. And um, the room was quiet. I think most people were kind of in a prayerful state. And we were all just watching the, you know, the monitor, you know, do the, you know, it's, it's bumpy thing as it's, as it's measuring the activity of the heart. Well, pretty soon it slows and slows and slows way down and eventually Nolan flatlines. And when Nolan flatlined, what I experienced was Mary Fran coming across the veil and scooping Nolan up out of his physical body. The two of them had this exquisite reunion, as you would expect between a mother and son, and that surprised me. But what surprised me even more was that, you know, I could, I could feel that. I could feel everything they were feeling. And then the two of them turned to me, came over, embraced me, and the three of us went into the light. And I have to tell you, Victoria, that I've never been in a place like that before. It was, it was like everything was the love of the universe, that it was compassion, it was joy, it was ecstasy, it was um, unrequited, or it was requited love. I mean, it was, it was such, um, 
a state of grace and bliss that I'm, you know, I'm blown away with it. But to tell you the truth, um, I had really all my attention on Mary, Fran, and Nolan. And the three of us had a chance to, um, to talk. And um, we affirmed our love and support for each other. Um, we had a chance to, to say our goodbyes, a proper goodbye, if there is such a thing. Um, you know, because I was at work and Mary Fran and Nolan were in the car. So I wasn't near the scene of the accident. So we had a chance to say goodbye. And then we had a chance just to be together. And then it seemed complete. It wasn't like anybody said anything. Um, and I have to tell you that in that state, when we were talking to each other, um, it wasn't in English. English is, is so restrictive. <laughs> you know, we've got words with boundaries on them. This was a, a pure communication between the three of us, and it contained, you know, much more um, breadth and subtlety. It's, it's a much superior <laughs> way of communicating. But then, it was, then we were done. And that that was okay. And so Mary Fran and Nolan turned and went further into the light. And I had a chance then to come back to my physical body sitting next to, you know, Brother Willie. So that's part one of the story. There are three parts. Do you, should I stop here and answer no, a question continue. or keep going? Yeah, continue. Well, I mean, let's let's hear the rest of it and then We'll we'll see if what what questions um, pop up. Okay, might kind of pop up in the meantime. But yeah, you're not going to leave us hanging with one part of the, <laughs> <laughs> the three part other two parts left to go. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm sitting there in, on the windowsill, and I'm up in the light with Mary Fran and Nolan, and we're we're doing our thing. And a hundred percent of my consciousness is there with their Mary Fran and Nolan. But I am also sitting in the hospital room next to Willie and in the room with all those other relatives. And a hundred percent of my consciousness is also in the room. And I know this because as I'm sitting there on the windowsill, it's like, ecstasy is trying to burst out of my physical body and and my face showed it i mean i had i had this huge grin on my face and if anybody had taken a second to look at me when i was in that state um i probably would have been deemed inappropriate and and so I did the only thing I could think of, which was to cover my face with my hands and just be in that pose while I'm up with Mary Fran and Nolan. So I didn't have a word for it then. I do now. I call it bilocation. I had two distinctly separate consciousnesses um, operating at the same time. I was with Mary Fran and Nolan. And I was in the hospital room um, sitting next to Willie and with all of the other grieving relatives. And so then when I came back um, to my physical body, um, you know, it, it took a moment to get kind of recentered again. And then I could, you know, get off the windowsill and go in and 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 be with everybody and hug and share tears and you know do what you need to do to support the other family members and be supported in return so that bilocation piece is part 2 part 3 um we have to fast forward uh, about 15 years 
and I'm doing my doctorate in leadership studies at the University of St. Thomas in um, St. Paul, Minnesota. And um, so I'm doing my dissertation, I'm doing the research for it, and I've decided to do um, research on near-death experiencers because they, um, when they come back to the physical world after having that experience, they are profoundly changed and how they present themselves to the world, their leadership style also profoundly changes. So I need to find people to talk to. And my first avenue for finding people was through hospitals and emergency room centers and um, like old folks homes. And, and I was getting nowhere because HIPAA laws were getting in my way, you know, they said, well, yeah, this stuff happens, but I can't tell you, Scott, and I'm not going to, you know, turn you over to somebody. So it wasn't working. So I had to reach out to other people. And so what happened was that I um, reached out to Mary Fran's family because um, most of the women in the family wound up in health care or helping professions of some sort. And... Um, uh, you know, they might know somebody. Well, I got a surprising um, answer back from one of the sisters, and she wants to remain anonymous, so I'm just going to call her the sister. <laughs> so this sister writes me back and says, Scott, you know, just a couple years ago, I had a near-death experience, and maybe you want to interview me. Sure. Great, wonderful. So we arrange it, get together, and it's a typical interview. You know, we're sitting on couches across from each other, and I got recording equipment in the middle, and it's turned on. And this is the story that she tells me. She said that she had um, was starting to take a new medication and went, um, happened to be at her parents' home, went upstairs to take a nap, and um, the next thing she knows, she's in this world of gray and she's kind of floating in this world of gray and the gray parts and there's Mary Fran. And Mary Fran walks right up to her, sticks a finger out and says, you've got to go back and you've got to go back now. The sister, who has quite a sense of humor, says in return, well, it's been a while, Mary Fran. Nice to see you too. <laughs> and but Mary Fran would have none of it. She now starts the finger wag thing and she does this and goes, You've got to go back and go back now. And it was with such force that the sister was startled. And when that happened, she wound up opening her physical eyes back in the bedroom and she found herself lying on the floor and up above her was this guy in an EMT outfit and he's turning away from her and he says to his partner, I've done everything I possibly can. I, we've lost her. She's, you know, we, there's nothing I can do, nothing more. The partner who's standing, looking down, sees the sister open her physical eyes and goes, you know, like, whoa, <laughs> we got her. And, you know, they do their EMT magic and they get her all situated and off to the hospital she goes and and they everything's fine. She's doing great. Still to this day, she's doing great. So that was her NDE story. And we're packing up. And as I'm putting my recording equipment away, I, I have this thought. And the thought was, sister, when Nolan made his final transition, something really unusual happened to me in the hospital room. I wondered if anything unusual happened to you too. And her eyes get just as big as saucers. And taking that as a yes, I put the recording equipment back out, fire it up, and say, 
Okay, tell you what, I want you to go first, and then I'll tell you my story, and then we'll compare notes. So this is what she told me. She said, Scott, I remember the moment really well because I was standing next to Nolan's bed and you were on the other side of the room sitting next to my brother, Willie. I said, yes, that's correct. And she said, when Nolan flatlined, what I experienced, meaning the sister experience, she, she said, what I experienced was Mary Fran coming across the veil scooping Nolan up out of his physical body. They had this exquisite reunion that I was able to participate in. And then the two of them turned to me and the three of us went to the light where we had a chance to be together and say goodbye. It was the exact same experience that I had. And she used almost exactly the same words. Wow. So... Victoria, in an instant, what happened was any doubt I had in my mind, you know, for that last 15 years, I've been, you know, wondering about, did this thing really happen? Nobody else I know ever had that kind of experience. But in an instant, all that doubt just went away because there is no way that she knew my story. I hadn't told anybody. 15 years, I hadn't told anybody. And... It was this loving confirmation that um, that what I experienced, what we experienced, was real, and um, it was probably one of the the greatest greatest gifts I've I've received. So that's part three. Wow. Well, that's quite a story and a half. But you know, it's very interesting these shared. Um, death experiences because I've had quite a few and really? I've written about them in all three of my books, different types of one. Um, you know, some involved the death of my mother, but there's been other weird occasions where you're in the, the two places at once and you're kind of simultaneously um you know, experiencing stuff, you know, they, you're like, is there anybody else seeing what's going on? Because, you know, you can feel that you're clearly two different areas. And, you know, it didn't necessarily relate to any death. So let's go ahead into maybe just some of the definitions before we go further. And because there's near death, and now we're, we're talking about um, shared oh. death, yep. which doesn't necessarily have to do maybe with death at all. So let's go over maybe some of the, uh, what's normally classified as a near death experience. You know, what does that look like? Does it, you see the light, you know, is that, is, are these experiences consistent or like with your um, interview from the family member having almost identical experiences. So take us a little bit more into what has historically been near death experiences. What does that look like? You know, and then we can go into shared experiences. Sure. So um, in a near death experience, it's a lot like what the sister described. There's some sort of an incident, maybe it's a car accident or whatever. And the, our physical body gets so traumatized that it dies. And our non-physical body, our soul, if you will, leaves the physical body, goes out into the ethers, you know, has some sort of an adventure. And then, you know, those wonderful souls that are back here in the physical plane, um, you know, maybe they got paddles or whatever, and boom, you know, and they reanimate the physical body and you know, that's the signal for the, the non-physical body to come back and re-enter the physical body again. And ta-da, you now have a near-death experience. And there's lots of common elements to a near-death experience. Um, just a couple of them that people might have heard of. Um, 
you know, when you leave your physical body, very often there's a guide to help take you to the light. And, and sometimes you'll go through a tunnel and that tunnel seems to be a structure that's designed to help you with the transition from the physical to the non-physical world, especially raise up your vibratory rate so that you can enter in easily. Um, you'll enter into the light um, and the light, um, I'm doing this with air quotes because um, there are three different flavors of light, if you will. There's black, white, and clear. And depending upon what light you enter, you have a, a different kind of experience. Um, and then once in the light, uh, very often there is a reunion with your dead relatives and friends, your pets are there. It's awesome. And, and then probably one of the most sacred things that could happen is that you have a chance to meet and merge with a divine being. And it could take all different kinds of forms, but this idea that the, that your energy and theirs could combine and you know what they know and they know what you know, and it's, it's a profound um, experience. And then typically this divine being is around when you go through your life review. And when the life review is over, you get to hang out um, in that area called the park, which is um, uh, life between lives. You know, it's like, where do you hang out before you come back here again? And there's some others, but in general, that is, uh, is the, the most common um, elements that you hear about in a, in a near death experience. Uh, some of the last ones, of course, is that with a near death experience, you gotta come back. Cause that's like the definition of it. <laughs> you know, we can't talk to people who stay there permanently easily anyway. So we, and then there's a, then they come back and they can, once they recover, they can then tell their story. Share death on the other hand, it's not about, you know, a soul that's leaving their physical body and destined to come back again. This is about accompanying somebody who is making their final transition. So in, in my case, um, that would be, um, I get to accompany Nolan. And so I get to go with, with Nolan as he is making his final transition. And and I get to, a chance to experience what he experiences however long I'm with him. And for us, you know, it was, it was pretty quick. It was, you know, I'm in the light with Mary, Fran, and Nolan. We get to communicate, and then I, and then I come back. But I've talked to, oh, so many people who've had a chance to, they went through the tunnel, they were there during the reunion, they got to be part of the life review, you know, so they got to, to do the same things as the person making their transition, but they got to share that experience with someone that they, they loved as they were making, making that final thing. So um, there's a couple of differences between near death and share death. For the most part, you know, oh gosh, what was that soap? Ivory soap. 99 and, and yeah, 100, 99 or seven pure purity or seven percent 99.7 percent pure or something i can't remember anyway um a near-death experience and a shared death experience are almost all alike i mean they have the same components it feels the same it's uh, it they're very much the same except that um, you know, you're going with somebody who actually is dying. So there's none of this maybe kind of sort of, you know, early on in near death research, that was the problem. People were saying, well, shoot, they came back. So they weren't really dead. So how do we know that that is the death experience? Well, now we do because we're actually going with people who, who are making their final transition and it's virtually the same. There is another difference, and that is that when people are making their final transition, 100% uh, 
of those folks, every single person in extensive studies, they all go to a benevolent afterlife. Every single one. So that means that if there's a less than positive experience that was designed to be part of your learning, knowing that you're going to be coming back to the physical. So it's associated with the physical world and not associated with the, the yeah, final world. Right. Well, so, I was going to ask you if, if anybody had that like negative and, you know, cause you had like the, the joyous kind of feeling, but is there anybody that's like getting the, Oh no, you done messed up. You gotta go back there and make things right, kind of, you know, uh guidance. So knowing that they're coming back, but you know, they they haven't been uh living, you know, in their highest and best good. And and there's a warning when they when they have the do you have any well, of those experiences? We have a lot of those in near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that people come in and they're up there and they're talking to their guide or they're talking to that divine being and and then the divine being you know is with them as they go through their life review and in the life review we know a couple of really cool things about it one is that there's uh, no judgment the only judge in a life review is you. You are judging your own life, period. That's, that's it. And, and the divine being is there um, to help you, actually better said, to love you through the experience. Because there's, you know, there's some, some spots in our lives where you know, it's like, ooh, that didn't go so well. <laughs> Or, you know, there's this message. It's like a two by four alongside the head, right? Yeah. You know, and saying, exactly. Taylor, what's the deal? Yeah. <laughs> we sent you down here on earth. You wanted to come to your home on earth so you could accomplish X, Y, and Z. Are you doing it? I'm thinking no. <laughs> you know, and so there's kind of that sass thing that happens, you know, yeah. where they are really letting you know that, listen, you're not on the path, man. Yeah. And we want you to get on the path. You want to be in the path. So that's why we're talking. And so anyway, there's, there's that experience. <laughs> but for your listeners, and this is worth the price of admission. This one thing I'm going to tell you right now is that when you are in a life review and you're being shown something of, a, a scene in your life and it's not going how you like in other words you're reliving the scene and you're going oh that isn't good now when i say relive the scene i gotta set the stage here because when you relive your life you get to relive it as you you get to relive it as the other meaning so you know victoria when you and i are are reliving this scene in our life review i get to be me and i get to be you <laughs> i i get to know everything you're thinking and feeling and so there were therefore i can really tell how my actions have affected you and then there's a third perspective the omniscient perspective or god's perspective if you will that says well how did this interaction actually make a difference in their lives but also their friends, their family, their community, you know, and maybe the, you know, humanity in total. How, how did this reaction happen? So back to where I was before, which is you're going through a life review and you're cringing, right? And you're going, oh God, you know, I could have been supportive. I could have been um let, let's do a scene uh okay i'm at the grocery store and the young girl who's checking me out is messing up things aren't working and i am short with her like didn't they ever train you what's the deal blah, blah, blah. you know <laughs> i'm being a jerk right yeah well in the life review what i figure out 
is that it's her first day on, on the job. And that Bob, the store manager, was supposed to train her, but he didn't. He just said, oh, here, go. The computer will lead you through everything. It'll be, it'll be easy. Well, it's not, <laughs> as we all know. And, and so I could have been understanding, but I wasn't. I was a jerk. Here's one thing you can do. And this is the, this is the thing that is so important. You can, you know, turn to your divine being, your, your guide through this life review and say, I would like to relive that over and do it differently. So, you know, divine being rewinds it and says, okay, Scott, do it. And I do it this time. And only this time I go, that badge of yours says that you're a trainee. How long have you been a trainee? Oh, this is your first day? You know what? You can always fix the paperwork. Don't worry. I've got the time. Take a deep breath. We'll get it sorted out. Not to worry. Oh, you want me to get Bob? Oh, I can go get Bob. You know. And and be really supportive. And I can see then the difference. You know, she doesn't go home and kick the cat. She goes home and pets the cat. She doesn't have a fight with her boyfriend because she got yelled at at work. You know. So as it moves out through uh, friends, family, and the community, it really makes a difference that, you know, I'm not a jerk, but that I'm a nice, supportive human being. Cool thing is that reliving of that experience is just as real as when you did it the first time or when I did it the first time and I was a jerk. So it adds to the sense of our humanity. It adds that reliving changes things. It changes our, our life. And it winds up, um, let's see how to describe this. It's like instant karma fix, right? You did something, you, should, you don't have to wait for the next life to go and you know, be a better person. You can fix it in your life review and have, have a chance to go at it again with all of the understanding that you, know, you possess as a human being at that time. So that's, that's, a really, that's a really cool thing. And we're you know, finding out about that stuff just now. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I always, and I don't know who else does this, but I always look at the opportunity if I didn't do it in that moment to go back and redo it, <laughs> you know, take yep. the time. I remember one time my husband took me out for um, dinner and, you know, the dinner didn't go so well, but like you said, with the, the um, waitress and my husband gave her a hard time because he wanted, you know, it wasn't exal, uh, um, you know, an enjoyable experience that he had his a, a expectations. You know, I went back in the kitchen. <laughs> I tracked her down in the kitchen. And, you know, I told her, I says, you know, he didn't really mean to do that because we hardly ever get a chance to spend any time. You know, it's a, you know, this was kind of, you know, a couple of months in the, in the, in the planning. And, you know, I'm so sorry that, you know, he didn't add any good to the, you know, to the thing he was adding to the, the negative, you know, that girl broke down in tears and he hugged me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And then I slipped her some more money too, but you know, I oh, mean, well. <laughs> yeah, on top of that, I mean, that was, she, you know, I'm like, here, here's my, I, I said, I didn't bring any, you know, extra money, but I'll give you some, I says, you know, just, just, you know, keep that in mind, you know, if you're having a good, a bad day, you know, it might, you know, not everybody's going to be a jerk. If you just tell them, I'm so sorry, I may be off my game today. I'm going to try to sometimes just letting people know heads up. I would always, all the jobs that I worked, I always gave them fair warning because there is the dark <laughs> side of me um, that it will come out when I'm tired or not feeling good. So, <laughs> yep. Yeah. But I mean, it's true. I mean, I don't think we should wait to the opportunity after life. And I mean, if you have the, you know, moment to fix it, you know, just go, hey, let's do a redo, right? Take two. Let's try this again, right? 
Yep. <laughs> and try to fix it in the now. So, you know, you create that ripple immediately. Like you says, the good karma instantly. Instantly. You know, and I'm a big advocate, even when things don't go right. And at least people, if they're trying to make it right, um, you know, I think it's important to, you know, meet them there. Um, I know with um, one of my friends, she says, you know, even when you talk about people who've irritated you, who've harmed you, she goes, you always seem to find like something good to say. Because I says, in, in honest, they're not all bad, <laughs> you know, but try to remember them not so much for the hurt, but for what what other benefits. So you kind of balance it out. And I don't know if it's the Dalai Lama that says, you know, if you can't help somebody, at least don't hurt them, right? That's what it kind of comes down to. Don't I think, I, I think that's part of the Hippocratic Oath if you're a yeah. doctor, you know, yes. do no harm. Yes, do no harm. So, mm -hmm. so there's, um, so I'm finishing up on your question. Uh, there's a, There's another difference between near death and shared death experiences. And that has to do with entry, you know, no, okay. because let's face it, you know, with a near death experience, you don't have, usually you don't have much control over that. There's an accident, a electrocution, a heart attack, a something, something really dramatic takes you out of this physical life, this world of duality and rusts you into another reality, the, the unity universe, the, you know, beyond time and space. I mean, where all the rules are different and there's, you know, there's, yeah, it's, it's different there. And most people are so shocked at, you know, gosh, I was driving the car and now I'm here. It, you know, the whole transition thing, really um, awkward <laughs> and they don't know what to do. They don't have the tools. And so, what winds up happening is that the near death experience happens to you as opposed to it being a co-creative experience, like what could happen in a shared death experience where, you know, I had the chance to have a conversation with Mary, Fran and Nolan, and we had a chance to affirm our affection and love for each other and, and say goodbye and be with each other, you know, so, you know, I got to be a, a an equal player in that, as opposed to you know, in, in near death experience, poof, you know, you're just you're just tossed into an environment that's you know totally alien. So that begs the question, you know, well, why did that shared death experience happen to you, and it didn't happen to you know thirty eight other people in the room? And, um, you know, for a long time, I didn't know the answer to that. I do now. Um, there's a guy by the name of William Peters who wrote a book called At Heaven's Door. He's a, he's a nice friend of mine now. And um, he did a study of 800 shared death experiencers. So, you know, the validity of this is really high. And what he determined was that um, first off that there has to be a heart connection between the person who's making the transition and the person in the physical so in this case it's that you know there's a heart connection between mary fran and nolan and me well that's true um you know i was in love with mary fran and i was just really getting to know Nolan and as as fate works out um Nolan never knew his biological father um he um opted out of the whole process disavowed any knowledge of their situation just chose not to be part of their life at all wow. and so Mary Fran never told him who he was and so when I came into the picture you know wow, you know, I get to have a man in my life, a father figure in my life, just like all the other seven-year-old boys in first grade, you know? So there was this, this bond between us. Second, 
is that I was open and receptive to something happening. You know, I wasn't actively grieving. I wasn't talking to people. I was, you know, it, um, I wasn't distracted by the environment around me. I mean, I was just sitting on the windowsill, right? Next to Willie. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, I'm just watching the bouncing ball. So, I, yeah, I was I kind of in a semi-meditative state? I might have been, yeah. And the third thing that's required is that there is an invitation from those who are making the transition back into the world of the physical. So in my case, it was Mary, Fran, and Nolan extending an invitation to me to come and join them. It's really difficult for us on this end to be able to match our energy level to those making their transition. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know how high. But when you're on the other side, it's, it's relatively easy, I understand, <laughs> to, you know, have them reach back and, and, you know, invite me, pull me through, adjust my energy level, use the language you want. But it's, um, that's the direction that, that makes the most or allows for the easiest shared death experience. So it's those three things. It's the heart connection. It's the, um, am I available uh, for this to take place? And can, um, is there an invitation present? So that's the, another key difference between a NDE and a shared death experience. I'm curious with the shared death, is there any specific, you know, uh, relation to age? Are they younger, older, or does it matter? I, <clears throat> excuse me, um, like a near death experience. Um, I mean, the, the research on near death experience is rock solid on this. It doesn't depend on who you are, what race, what age, what religion, what country. It happens all over the world equally. Um, and so I, we're finding that out to be true um, in shared death experiences too. Uh, but with one caveat, and that is that the research to date has been done mostly with adults. Mm -hmm. So do young children have it? I'm guessing they do, but the, the research just isn't there yet. Well, it's talking about research. Let's dive into maybe some of the science, because I know um, scientists are very quickly to dismiss it as just chemical reactions. Um, you know, <laughs> your your body starting to go into dying mode, so it creates chemical reactions and fantasy stories that may not be true. So. Has now that there's more and more information, has science are they still clinging to that? Have they made any revisions or re looking at this or what's that's going a, on in that community? Yeah, that's a great question, Victoria. Because you know, at the beginning, so Raymond Moody wrote the very first book on near death experiences, it came out in 1975, it was called Life After Life, and it planted this flag in the ground and said, I, he was a, a resident, a medical student, when he gathered his data. And he said, I have discovered this thing. I've written this book, it's full of anecdotes. But you know, I have to finish medical school. <laughs> so would you other researchers go out and try to figure out what's going on? I thought that was great. And, and so they did. And there was a, a group of them that got together, um, and eventually that became the International Association for Near Death Studies. And there was a, some really key players in that. Um, 
from the scientific perspective, there was uh, Ken Ring at the University of Pennsylvania, sorry, Connecticut, and um, Dr. Bruce Grayson at the University of Virginia. And they, especially Bruce Grayson, um, he seemed like he had a mission. And the mission was people would come to him and say, you know what, I think near-death experiences are the result of hypoxia. That's, you know, lack of oxygen in the brain. And he would go, oh, that's interesting. I'll design an, an experiment to see whether that's true or not. And he did. The answer is, no, hypoxia is not. Well, I think it's the God spot. And they do a thing and they do that. Nope, it's not the God spot. And he just did experiment after experiment. Is it, you know, a dream state? Is it uh, my favorite? <laughs> you, you'll love this. Um, the memory of the birth experience. You know? <laughs> Go to the light. You know? <laughs> no, that's not it either. Anyway, so gosh, it's been um, about 10 years, sorry, 20 years now. Um, a really breakthrough book by Dr. Pim Van Lommel um, called Consciousness Beyond Life. Um, really nailed down um, the scientific case for near-death studies. It was followed up by Bruce Grayson's seminal work called After. Do I have it? Uh, anyway, yeah, it's on my bookshelf there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, so at the end of um, Dr. Grayson's uh, academic career, he wrote a uh, kind of a summary book. This is everything I know about near-death experiences. And it really clearly states that it's a real thing, that we have a non-physical body, it inhabits our physical body, and that we live before this physical incarnation, we live, of course, during it, and then we live afterwards. And that consciousness is not a product of the brain. It doesn't reside within the brain. And so all of that scientific case now has really been put to bed from my perspective. Now, are there unanswered questions? Sure, there always will be. But we can, with a high degree of assurance, say that near-death experiences are just as described, same way with shared death experiences that that is what the dying proce process looks like. Um, this is what we learn from it. And now the research is, has taken a decided turn into how do you live with what you know? So that's the interesting question that is coming out these days is when we're interviewing people who've had near-death experiences, like how does that experience help you to live in the physical world? How does it give you perspective on what, what's going on here so that you can um, really um, enjoy life in the physical, you know, and, and just revel in all of the, the beauty and the contrast that is here for us in the physical world. So we know that it's making a difference in our culture. This idea that near-death experiences are, are real. It's taking hold. Well, in popular culture, I mean, let's face it, in the last um, film of Harry Potter, right, he has this battle with he who shall not be named. And, you know, and he gets struck and he dies and he goes up into heaven. He meets Dumbledore. They have a conversation. He finds out things he shouldn't know unless he was up there. And then he comes back into the physical world and, you know, and everybody leaves a better life because of, of that experience. And hang on. I'll be right back. Don't go away. <laughs> okay. Here we go. This is probably one of the most interesting things that I have observed about our culture and near-death experiences goes like this. So think 10 years ago, 
ish, maybe 15, somewhere in there. And, you know, Victoria, somebody said to you, close your eyes and give me an image for death. And more than likely, you would come up with this image. Let me see if I can get this in front of the camera. Oh, right? Yeah. Right. It's the Grim, Grim Reaper. Reaper. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, that image, I mean, I'm going to hold this back up again. It's lonely. It's violent. It's, um, it's capricious. You know, it, this is mostly what you want to do is be afraid of death. Will you go with me on that? I, I can go with that, yeah. Okay, so now, if you said today, you could even Google this if you want, mm -hmm. image for death, what do you get? You get this. Mm. You get the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. So in our culture, Western culture, but it's you know leaking out into other cultures around the world, that is now the image of, of death. It is... You know, you move to the light, so it's bright. And in that light are your dead friends and relatives and divine beings, and they're welcoming you. And there's a way to make that transition from, that's what the tunnel's all about. You know, that you're here in the physical and you get to move to the non-physical. And you get, the tunnel will help guide you. And if you want, there's a guide, guide, you know, maybe it's your, dead grandma or, or maybe it's but a divine nobody's thing. holding the sickle right <laughs> nobody's holding the sickle in fact they are just pleased as punch that you have joined them in the non-physical world and when you get to that reunion you know they want to know stories you know what did you learn I, you know and they'll tell you their stories and i mean it's it's this grand reunion it's it's fun it's filled with love and joy and you know it is one of those welcoming events that happens during a near-death experience. So it really is like going home. It's not at all like the Grim Reaper. And that has happened because of the work that scientists have done to say, this is a done deal. These are, this is real. Shared death experiences are real. We know a lot about them. And, you know, I think between um, the International Association for Near-Death Studies and NDERF, which is Near-Death Experience Research Foundation, there we got that, so NDERFOff.org, they've got something like 30,000 cases that you can go on their website and you can filter, you can read them, you can, you know, just like, what do you want to know? And then, good Lord, go on YouTube and just type in NDE and, you know, go down that rabbit hole. Holy <laughs> smokes. It's just, it just goes on forever and ever. So there's no secret about this anymore. The research is really good and it's really solid. And some really extraordinary people have had um, near-death experiences that are highly credible mm -hmm. and, and tell great stories that are filled with wisdom that we can all learn from. And now lately, uh, people are learning meditative techniques so that they can go and, and do this visit ahead of time. You know, it's kind of like, okay, Scott, you know, you told me <laughs> all about this stuff. Well, I want to see it before I go. We can do that now. Um, wow. we, we know what the vibratory states are. Of, excuse me. <clears throat> we know what the vibratory states are of, you know, where you meet your guide and the tunnel and the reunion and the divine being and the um, past life review and, and that area of life between lives. We know what that vibratory level looks like and feels like. And, you know, we know how to change our vibrations now in doing meditative practices. So we can go there and, you know, test all this stuff out for ourselves. You want to be a skeptic? Go right ahead. Just check it out. So 
Uh, that is a really long answer to a simple question, but um, I get wound up about this because the science is great. It's really good. And, you know, a simple book like After uh, by Dr. Bruce Grayson, you know, just really nails the whole thing and says, you know, this is what we've done. This is, you know, this is what the research says. And, you know, the bibliography on that thing is just nuts. It's great. So if you're, you know, really want to dive in, you can do that. Wow. Wow. That is some good information. Now, I do have one last question for you. Sure. Can, can we find more about you, your books, um, your meditation CDs? Tell us where we can find more. The easiest place to find me is at near death meditations plural near death meditations.com and my story is there um i do workshops where i take people to visit those places described by near death experiencers i have albums um that that you know help you go there using binaural beat technology which is really good for raising up our vibratory level to the right state. So that's the best place, neardeathmeditations.com. And um, check me out on YouTube, The Afterlife Files. And you get to see, you know, interviews that I've done. And you get to just, yeah, there's lots of fun stuff on there. So have fun messing around. <laughs> there awesome. you go. Awesome. Very awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your fantastic insights about death, life, and everything in between and after. And I want to thank all of my listeners for tuning into the Leap Into Your Story podcast, where you discover your inner story, work through the process, and meet others who've done it so you can be guided to your journey to writing your story. Remember to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're there, subscribe and like us via your favorite social media. We are looking forward to seeing you next time here on the Leap Into Your Story podcast. Thank you for tuning into the Leap Into Your Story podcast where you discover your inner story, break down the process, and meet others who've done it so you can leap into your own story. Remember to visit our website at leapintoyourstory.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're there, subscribe and like to us via your favorite social media network. We're looking forward to seeing you next time on the Leap Into Your Story podcast.